So we will begin. So did you guys do surveys? Uh, <laughs> or articles, we, or we can just talk about we things. Did one. Oh, did you guys do people you knew or, or did you guys go down to like Walmart? Yes, an article too. No. Oh, great. I, I talked to my um, born Jewish family who were Jewish and they were Jewish now Pentecostal Christian. Oh. That's a friend of yours? Oh, sister-in-law. Okay, don't give up too much now. Okay. Because we'll get to that in the second half. And then Dean talked to um, one of our friends. A guy next door is the Asset Center, which is kind of a rooming house. The Asset Center? Homeless. Homeless, yeah. Oh! When I think of the Asset Center, maybe I've been watching too many FBI and CIA shows. (laughs) The Asset it started out as the asset house. I don't know what it is. And I is. don't know what it is now because mm-hmm. it's now owned by another nonprofit. But but that's what we still call it. Okay. No is, problem. We live right next door to it. Awesome. That'll be good. I'm excited to get to that and we'll be able to dig deep into those. Brian did a couple of interviews I know on campus today or yesterday. Today, so we'll, we'll have more fodder. Don't worry about it now. We'll get it at break. So today we're in week two. Uh, No, week three, sorry, my weeks kind of blend together. Uh, And we're dealing with truth. So today, uh, out of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, chapter one. Now, uh, tactics, the game plan for for talking about your Christian uh, convictions, we kind of delayed that because you hadn't gotten your book yet. And everybody else that we had in the class didn't have the material. So we just delayed it. So we'll talk about, uh, so really we're back a week. So it'll be the forward through chapter one. And then we were supposed to be through Genesis 14. So let's start with there. Do you guys have any questions in regards to the biblical text as you were reading through? Yes, I never read through that part between Adam and Noah. The table of nations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after, uh, and then after Noah, Mm-hmm. Too, but just how kind of I said, oh, there weren't many generations between Adam and Noah. And then Dean says, yeah, but you got to remember, everybody lived to be about a thousand years old. <laughs> right, right. I mean, they, they, the longevity. And there's great because there's a lot of scientific reasons why we can believe that the dates they give us are true. Plus, they actually have, have you ever heard of the Sumerian's King's List? Sumerian's King's List is a list of reigning monarchs before and after a flood. And before the flood, uh, they have calculated years that are way beyond even what we have for patriarchs. But they have a distinct historical edge saying there were, prior to the flood, there were kings who lived extraordinary amounts of time. After the flood, they had normal reigns. And we can actually historically place some of them in the Sumerian kings list that happened after the flood. So it's interesting that we have it. Now, when we find, they have it listed. They documented it. So it's, it's actually a cuneiform uh, piece that is listing uh, kings before a flood and after a flood, their reigns and their length of their reigns. And it's interesting because when you look at the Bible, we have very detailed account. It's almost like we have specific information where when we look at some of the things on the Sumerian Kings list, it is more, seems more mythological, but are they remembering something, but they just don't have the hard details to, but they were kept uh, for, so some fascinating things with that. There's also another one and then we'll move on. A guy by the name of Cooper. What's his first name? Bill. Bill Cooper. Uh, Yeah, he was a British historian that did a lot with the early workings. And one of them uh, is called the historicity of Genesis. But he also has one called after the flood, where he goes into a lot of detail of that table of nations and how accurate it is. uh, And even references some works that unfortunately are now lost to us. But Bill Cooper, after the flood. It talks about like the there's some of these cultures that trace their lineages back to something that sounds like Japheth or something yeah. that sounds oh, like yeah. Ham or Shem. But it's, it's very like, good. Whoa. He's got detailed oh. stuff. His names are wow. very closely yeah. linked where it's like, this seems true. Sounds, yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. And there are some Christian archaeologists, and I apologize, I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, 
but ask me later and I'll get it. He did some things with uh, the gentleman who does the Exodus uh, and the Sinai. Um, no, not David Roll. Anyways, uh, I think his last name is Petraeus, but I'm, no, that's probably a general. <laughs> So it, it's, it's a, we'll get to it. But he has actually done research in regards to the Tower of Babel and dispersion within the, the, the different uh, ancient Mesopotamian peoples. Uh, some fascinating work. So there's good historicity with that. Nathaniel Jensen studying the genetic connections. Oh, he's that doing, it. okay. And that's really good. Cool. Yeah. So we have a lot of information for, but any other questions then over the biblical reading? Probably so pretty familiar. Than, yeah, you know, it just seems like Adam and Eve probably sinned on about the eighth day. It seems like, doesn't <laughs> yeah, I, I, probably not best for this class, but you know, they. I heard someone say, you know, how long before you know? <laughs> so we don't know, yeah. and it may have been God actually gave a period of time where He wouldn't allow Eve to conceive. There may have been something along those lines, knowing something we don't know. We're not given enough information. We just don't, we just know that there was no child conceived prior to the fall. Yeah. Uh, what an interesting situation that would create. Yeah. Um, but, but he didn't, and maybe God in his grace, obviously, uh, knew that. So we just don't have enough information on that. But yeah, but it seemed like it was probably pretty quick. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Blaming her the right out of the get go. The blame game started there. Okay, what I'm going to do is because I wasn't sure where everybody was. I didn't know what kind of a group we would have, and so I did put some of my points in a PowerPoint. So this also will help for anybody, uh, Pam, who is uh, listening through Zoom. Uh, so we'll hit some of the main points just real quickly on I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Okay, then we can go to questions and then we'll go to tactics. So any objection to going that route? Okay, cool. So throughout the course, this I didn't think we talked about. We're going to go through basically, it, it's almost like a deductive argument. It's from point to point to point. And any point along the way, if someone can totally demolish the point that is made, then we find some weaknesses in the Christian. But if it's an intellectual assent to say, okay, yes, the evidence that you support. And again, in this book, this is not exhaustive evidence, okay? This is just basically starting to help people to see that there is evidence. Um, when you get into the historicity, there are so many great books out there uh, that just couldn't be covered in one. So the one thing I wanna make sure is that each one of these points that he is making, if you feel that it's not as strong as you would like it, there's additional information, again, He's writing a book that people will hopefully consume. <laughs> and if it's too long, they won't. But when it comes to archaeological evidence, when we get into the verification of the scripture, but what he does is he goes through a step-by-step -step process and you can pick anybody up in the middle of that process. So if anybody's been a part of a 12-step process, I have. <laughs> they are very beneficial, okay? This, though, is hopefully for people... Um, who are addicted to really helping to people to see the truth of the Christian message. So we start with total skepticism, okay? So this is one that we can support. And no matter where you are, they're, they're on this spectrum of these 12 steps. This is really why I like this book. There's a lot that I disagree with being a young earth creationist, but I think that even the arguments they put forth as old earth creationist arguments, we can actually use because then we are, to a certain degree, assuming some of the cosmic evolution. And I'm not saying that those who are old Earth creationists have anything to do with evolution, but they take the Big Bang and those things. So we, as, a, uh, as, as young Earth creationists, can take their arguments, their presuppositions, and we can show that they're still incorrect in regards to evolution. Does that make sense? So it's a great process and it'll help us to learn. So the 12 steps, and this is definitely for support. First, the things that we're gonna talk about today, yeah, is truth about reality is noble. And it is in your book. And the other thing that I like about the book is that it'll tell you what steps we're on, okay? So if you know somebody that's a pure skeptic, you're gonna have to start at step one, 
you're going to have to help them understand that truth is a thing. It's an objective thing and it is knowable. The opposite of true is false. We'll get that more in the next chapter. Okay, number three, it is true that the theistic God exists. This is evidenced by the beginning of the universe or the cosmological argument. Then we have the design of the universe, teleological argument. Okay, the design of life, which is also a teleological argument. A telos just means the end or design or uh, how um, along those lines. Okay, moral law. Okay, now if you look at these, do you see how one builds on the next? If you agree with the first one, then you go on to the second one. If you agree on the next one, then you go on. They are sequential that will eventually lead you to an, at least an intellectual acknowledgement of the truth of Scripture. Now, remember last week we talked about that most people don't deny things on intellectual levels, but usually on emotional or volitional levels. Okay, so, but you can say, so they already believe that truth is knowable. They already believe that the opposite of true is false. Well, then you start with, well, this is a theistic universe. How do we know that is? Let me give you some thoughts. Now, again, I actually do a presentation that goes over 24 arguments for the existence of God. Some are a little more obscure, <laughs> hard to get through. Others are not. So again, this is not comprehensive, so do not think that once you've gone through these four arguments, if they've defeated them or if they're not convinced by them, that we're done. That's not the case. Again, we look more at a cumulative case argument. What best explains reality in its fullness? Okay. So as it goes on, though, if God exists, so if we show to them that it's more reasonable than not to believe that this is a theistic universe, then we talk about miracles. Because if a God exists, the miracles are possible. And if miracles are possible, then they can be used to confirm a message from God or a messenger from God, which we see expressly in Scripture. Well, if miracles then can point, we have recordings of these miracles in a book called the Bible, the New Testament in particular. So then we go to the New Testament. Is it reliable? Can we trust it? Or is it like the game of telephone, as a lot of people try to tell us? But we're going to say there's early testimony, there's eyewitness testimony, there's uninvented, authentic testimony, and we'll get into all this. The eyewitnesses were not deceived. So the New Testament, if we see that it's reliable, the New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. Then we give that argument. Many people will say, God, he never claimed to be God. Well, just from a reading we had last night in the home Bible study that we do through Zoom, Jesus knowingly fulfilled a prophecy from Zechariah about a donkey that would ride into Jerusalem, behold your king. He willingly did that. He knew what the prophecy was, so that was a self-conscious awareness. Also, he forgave sins, how he talked about himself, the son of man. Sometimes that's misinterpreted, but we'll go through those arguments. Jesus's claim to be God was confirmed, his fulfillment about prophecies, his sinless life, the most important one, the prediction and accomplishment of his resurrection. When it comes to ancient history, there is no fact of ancient history more attested to than the death of Christ and his resurrection. So we will get into that. It's called the minimal facts argument. We'll get into that, okay? So therefore, if you're following the logical flow, if each of the points before has been proven, at least made reasonable, therefore Jesus is God. Then we go back, whatever Jesus who is God teaches is true. We go back, Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God, therefore it is true and anything opposed to it is false. Okay, these are principles that we've learned throughout. Okay, so the reason I like this is you can take anyone along the spectrum and at least get a feel for where they are and how you can take them to the next. Now, a lot of people, you may skip steps. They may all of a sudden, hi, how are you? Hi, oh, you're fine. No problem whatsoever. So they skip steps, but you'll know where to find them. So if they're, they're questioning uh, the historicity of the Bible, okay, I believe it's a theistic universe, but I'm not sure the Bible is it. And anyways, it's, it's a bunch of letters that were created way after the fact well, hey, why don't we look to see if that's really true? And then you can give them evidence to help them to see that, man, we don't have the number of copies in any other form of literature than we do in the Bible and closest to when they were actually written. So we have some amazing things, but we'll get to all that. So 
Again, we're going to do questions and discussions. So we did a little bit of discussion on the scripture, and you were supposed to be through 14 today. So we'll just keep going. And that's not too much a chapter a day, is it? No, it's pretty easy. Okay, so I love this quote. So can we handle the truth? If you're into movies, you know, that is from A Few Good Men when he says, and he references it in the book. Men stumble over the truth from time to time, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. I think that's powerful. I think it's very appropriate. I think people get hit with it. It's almost like sideswipe. You see a deer in the headlight, and then they move on. And it doesn't affect them, which is sad. And I think the pace of life does a lot. Winston Churchill had a lot of great quotes. I think one of them he said is, uh, uh, what is it, a lie gets halfway around the globe before the truth has time to get its pants on, I think is another quote that he did. Uh, he, he a brilliant man. Okay, So how do we resolve this cultural schizophrenia when it comes to truth? Now again, is truth knowable, and specifically we'll get into, is truth knowable in religion? Okay, So these four things are what we're going to look at. What is truth and can truth be known? That's really what he goes over in chapter one. Now, can truths about God be known? And so what who cares about truth? These are more fully covered, even though they're touched on in chapter one, they're more fully covered in chapter two. Okay, so we're really going to focus on the first one. So what do you think of the following statement? If something is true, it's true for all people at all times in all places. All truth claims are absolute, narrow, and exclusive. Do you think that's a true statement or a false statement about truth? It seems like it should be true. If truth is true, it should be true every place, all time. Okay. A lot of the times a good thing to do is to try to find counterfactuals or, or, or things that are contrary to it to try to see. So try to think of something that is not true for all people at all times and all places. Can you think of something? Do you have something on your mind? <clears throat> I don't know if this is one or not, but it's true that if you live here in the Grand Valley, you need to water your lawn if you want it to be green. Okay. But if you live in the tropics or even the Midwest, it would still be a truth because it's referring to the objective place of Grand Junction. Yeah. yeah. See, and that's where you can get tripped up because people say, or he gives an example in the book that on this day at this point, I feel nice and cool because Brian's got the fan on me. He yeah. knows that I overheat. So that is true in all places for all times, no matter where you are, that even if you're in Mongolia, the truth that Scott is cool right now where he's standing is true, okay? Now, but that, that it's a good practice. Whenever you find someone who gives you an idea that says this is true, try to find, falsify it. That's really what we should be doing with science. Uh, Karl Popper especially worked on this, that science should really be in the act of falsifying. You should be trying to falsify what you believe. When you try to confirm what you believe, you can get into the echo chamber. You can get into confirmation bias. So we really should try to falsify. So if we make a statement like this, it's good mental practice to try to think of something that would not fit. And then talk to somebody about it. Okay? Don't call me at 2 in the morning saying, ha, 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 Scott, I found something that negates what you just said. I'll say, who are you? I <laughs> know. Yes, Brian. Uh, one of the ones I'll, I'll use is murder is wrong. Or killing people is wrong. Is that true? I think you would need to, and that's another good point. You need to make sure that you have specific uh, claims and not general. Sometimes, and you always hear this, you know, it is um, qualified by a thousand or, you know, qualifications. I think we do need uh, to make sure that we're talking about certain truths, that we look. Um, and maybe we would say uh, killing innocent people is wrong. Yeah, I usually talk to people and it's like, okay, killing somebody, you know, out of 
self-defense or right. even in time of war, you know, it's maybe justifiable killing somebody for fun. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, it's very, we can relate it to answers that we get. Sometimes you have general answers that require general responses, or you have vague questions that you're not real. So sometimes we have to fine tune. And so, yes, a discussion of the truth, and those are great for discussion uh, that we can engage with people. Is that making sense to everyone? All right. I believe this is absolutely true. Okay. Now, it does take some parsing to talk to people, but I think we see it in everyday life and we'll get to that. Do all truths exclude their opposites? So if Jesus is God according to reality, is anything contrary to that false? Yes. yes, yeah. It's just, you know, you can't be both pregnant and not pregnant in the same time and in the same relationship. You either are or you aren't, you cannot be both. Okay, that's what we'll get into more of the law of non-contradiction when we actually talk about the railroad. Okay, so how about religious truths? Do they exclude their opposite? And we're going to get into, they'll try to say that there are no such thing as religious truths. And we're going to get to that in a second when we get into uh, some of the other ideas. Everyone's truth claim is just as narrow. All truth claims, if you are claiming anything that has any idea of specificity and objectiveness, it will exclude all others. Give you an example. Two plus two equals four. It excludes all other possibilities. There are an infinite number of incorrect answers, but there is only one correct answer. Okay, this is also similar um, you know, not, not just in uh, mathematics, but other areas as well. It is always. So a lot of people come up, and this is one of the quips we hear from atheists quite a lot. Last person I heard it from was Ricky Gervais. Um, but he basically said, oh, we just deny one more God than you. Because they'll say, oh, we deny Zeus, and we deny this. And so they say, you deny a thousand gods, we just deny a thousand and one. And there's supposed to be that argument. And a lot of people, unfortunately, don't think through it. Well, the reason we don't deny the one is because there is verifiable information that shows that it's reasonable. Is it reasonable to believe in Zeus? Uh, no. Is it reasonable to believe in some of these? No. Is it reasonable to believe two plus two equals four? Yes, we have good evidence. We can discount every other one. We only need one. So it really is a bad argument uh, because uh, when truth, truth is very exclusive, okay? So many truths. These are the truths that he says. Now, if you didn't have time to read, I'm going to go through the six or the five main things about truth. Truth is discovered. It's not invented. It's not a construct of our mind. Mathematical equations are found, but they're true to reality and they work because they're already built into the fabric of time. And, and space and energy and matter, okay? Newton did not discover or did not invent gravity. He discovered it. And he was able to put it into the language, universal language of mathematics. Um, we have the barometer, okay? Galileo did not invent barometric pressure. He discovered it and learned how to measure it. Okay. Truth is transcultural. It is worldwide. And a lot of people will try to bring up, too, that, well, there's different mores. Again, a um, since we have multiple ways that people deal with things, then there's no right answer. Okay. But it's interesting because C.S. Lewis one time took this objection and said, oh, they kill people here, they kill people there. He said, when you do research in these cultures, you find out they know. They're doing it to terrify the people. They know that killing is wrong. It's all dependent on who it's okay to kill. <laughs> they just don't think you're, or in many ways, going into the 20th century with World War II, it's just whether you were technically human or not, according to their worldview. Killing's always been wrong. These cultures all see killing as wrong. It's just how they define the people that make up. Does that make sense? Okay. So. It goes everywhere. It is worldwide. Truth is unchanging. OK? 
okay? Even, okay, this is really weird. This is one of the first philosophical questions that started in the pre-Socratics in ancient Greece <laughs> is the river. You never step into the same river. So is life being or becoming? Okay, so these were some of their big questions. Is anything unchanging? Is there consistence? Uh, he is unchanging, yes. But truths, when we think about it, these are more, in a lot of cases, abstracts uh, that are not necessarily a great topic of discussion that, not, that are not changing. Okay, but yes, but it's interesting. One thing I'd like to bring up, and I think I haven't developed it, but I think it would be a great argument. I'm sure somebody out there has already thought about it. But if everything is changing, every, and you, you can help me on this, Brian, you overturn every single one of the trillion cells in your body in what, three years? It depends on the type of cells. For bone cells, it's like 10 years. Okay, so by yeah, 10 years, totally new. by 10 years, you have rebuilt every cell in your body. In your skin, it's like three weeks. Okay, three weeks. If those kind of chemical changes, shouldn't our personalities change? Shouldn't our conscious self-awareness change? Because our construct is totally different. So the continuation of a self-identity in a world that's supposed to be just atoms colliding, I think is a big problem. And again, I haven't flushed it out, but I've thought about that as, and there are arguments from consciousness in that, okay? But look at this, even though our beliefs about the truth may change. Ptolemaic system of astronomy. The Ptolemaics saw the earth, and this really goes back to Aristotelian philosophy, uh, but that the earth is the center of the universe. Did, was the earth ever the center of the solar system, I should say? No, but it was believed to be for 1500 years. They even had systems that would help show, they could approximate and they could make predictions about the starry host. But they believed it, it was 1500 years, it was wrong. Beliefs may change, okay, but the truth doesn't change. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, can beliefs change a fact if they are sincerely held? No, no matter how much Napoleon Dynamite thinks he is Napoleon Bonaparte, <laughs> it's not gonna work. He has the greatest suit, brown. But do you get that point? No matter how you believe something, it doesn't make it true. I mean, these really are self-evident. I don't think anybody would disagree, but they don't think about it in the context of truth. Is truth affected by the attitude of the one professing it? No. I always tell my kids, if, again, I like Napoleon Bonaparte, not, well, he's interesting. So even if I claim to be Napoleon Bonaparte, if I tell you two plus two equals four, Am I still right in the truth of mathematics? I am. We need to verify truth. It's called the genetic fallacy, when we try to fault an idea because of where it comes from. We need to break ideas based on the truthfulness of them, okay? Then we have, oh yeah, and then um, doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. We got everybody. We have Winston Churchill, Mother Teresa, you know, we have Stalin, we, we have all sorts, okay? All truths are absolute truths. And we talked about this earlier. Agree or disagree? What do you guys think? If it is true. Now, again, certain truths may be very uh, uh, small in scope. It is an absolute truth that I prefer at this moment in time, a certain type of ice cream. That's my favorite. It is true, okay, for me at this time. Now I may change my mind. This is where it gets into, sometimes it'll get confusing, but truth is exclusive, it's absolute, okay? So in short, contrary beliefs are possible. We see it throughout the world, but contrary truths are not possible. So as we go through it and you're evaluating different worldviews, we have three different views. Well, we have more than that on Christ. Christian Orthodox view is Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, okay? 
we have the Muslim view that he was a prophet and he did not die on the cross. Christianity said he died on the cross. Atheists, many atheists, believe that he didn't even really exist. Well, you can't have Jesus as God, Jesus as not God, and Jesus not actually existing. <laughs> all true. All of them can be incorrect, but not all of them can be correct. Because built into reality is the law of non-contradiction. Okay? So, it doesn't matter what you think. Um, we have contrary opinions on what we like, whether the world is flat. They're still out there, those people. Um, and that's from uh, Shirley, uh, oh, what's her last name? Shirley uh, McLean. I am God, just with a little G. Okay, so what we look at then, and we're going to go quick. Okay, no matter what you believe, ice cream is not good for diabetics, insulin is. I don't care if you think the world is flat, it's not. And if you think that you are God, uh, it's either you or Christ or somebody else, not both of you. Okay, so how do we deal with the modern assertion? Okay, that there is no truth. I love this. We won't play the whole thing, but maybe it'll bring back good memories. <laughs> Oh, my sound. I forgot to hit the sound. You can switch it right now. Sorry. Oh. Well, we'll just reminisce. It may be a little odd. How many of you grew up with? Oh, I love the Roadrunner. And it was fun to watch because you knew he was never going to catch the Roadrunner. The reason, and I play this especially for my kids, is because I try to ingrain what they're going to do is they call it the roadrunner tactic. Now, when we get into the book on tactics, he calls it the suicide tactic. But he also uses other, he has patricide and he has, you know, infanticide and all these in regards to ideas self-destructing, okay? They call it here the roadrunner. They call it the process of turning a self-defeating statement on itself which basically means that it doesn't stand up to its own standards. We've used this, we talked about it briefly, I don't speak a word of English. Obviously it's necessarily false because I spoke it in English. There is no such thing as truth, yet we're intending that statement to be true, so it's self-defeating, it denies itself. Um, or, we, uh, or we can say there are no absolute truths. Well, is that an absolute? You see that you run into problems. Well, in logic, if something is defying the law of non-contradiction, if it's incoherent or if it defies itself, it's necessarily false. So this is a great tool for showing whether something is false if we properly understand what the person is saying. Again, a lot of people, the Trinity, the way people express the Trinity, it is contradictory. The way a lot of, I have heard people say it is three people in one person. That is nonsense. Okay? So sometimes when you're talking to other people in other worldviews, they may just express something, but it's the way they express it. Really, it is three persons in one essence. Okay? It's maybe incomprehensible, but it's not, non, it's not contradictory. Okay? So we have to be careful uh, because someone could then say, Christianity is a contradiction from the get-go because your Godhead is three persons in one person. Have you guys ever heard it expressed that way? I've heard a lot of younger Christians express it. Now, sometimes they, they, uh, they'll say three individualities in one person or along those lines. So we have to be careful. Ideas have consequences. And ideas have unintended consequences. Does anybody know what that is? And Pam, if you know, you're just going to have to scream. <laughs> Think of 18 or 1791, if that helps anybody. Eli Whitney. Cotton gin. cotton gin. That is the cotton gin. They believe, and that was not Eli Whitney's purpose. I don't know anything about Eli Whitney. Um, but they said that it extended slavery in the South for at least another 60 years unintended consequences. Look at this. These are inventions. Nuclear fission, moldboard plow, assembly line, anesthesia, personal computer, printing press. All of these 
took facts of the universe, truths about the universe, truth about us, and put them into inventions, used them. And how did they alter the world? Look at this one. Uh, it's four in the middle of the pill. Wow, that is very ideologically based. Okay, so what we have is now, when it originally came out, try to take note how many religious leaders. These were the ranking of the most influential people of all times. Jesus Christ, Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton. Do you know Isaac Newton wrote more even though he was a little out there? He was a Unitarian. He did not believe in the Trinity. Uh, but he actually wrote more uh, books on uh, Christian hermeneutics than he did on science. Yep, Leonardo da Vinci, and it goes on. But look at all these. Most of these, we think, see Charles Darwin, number eight. Ideas have consequences, and especially ideas of the truth and the falsity of something have drastic ideas. Truth is immensely important, okay? Now, I go on to this next one because I was really upset that it took all the way to, where is he? Uh, 54. I think Walt Disney was much more influential. <laughs> but you can see. So we teach students there's no right or wrong. Should we be surprised when we hear about a woman at her prom that has a baby, puts it in the uh, trash can, and continues to the prom? Or we think of, you know, the monsters when it comes to uh, Klebold and Harris in the Columbine shooting. This is a great quote, it's in your book. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and shock to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the Geldines be fruitful. We take it away from them and then we expect them to act differently. We take any support for them being uniquely human, that a human is different from any other thing. You tell them they're animals, and it really does work out that way, okay? Moral, he goes into the EE story, but complete agnosticism and skepticism is self-defeating. This is another point I want you to know. If you are a pure skeptic, then you will doubt your skepticism, which moves you to certainty. It defeats itself. I know that may make your head spin a little, but truth cannot be denied. Because when you say there is no truth, you are assuming that that is true. And since it's self-defeating, it's incoherent, it means that the statement is necessarily false. I know that it may be a different way of thinking for everybody, but this tactic really is invaluable. Whether it's seen as suicide, whether it's seen as, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, blowing the roof off. Uh, there's many ways of calling it, okay? So, religious beliefs cannot all be true. They're just like everything else in life. Gravity. If there is a spiritual or religious component, there is a truth to it, okay? They teach opposites. You can't both walk and not walk at the same time. We have very different beliefs. It's kind of like a wet candle. It doesn't exist, okay? So what are some of the examples we can think, and we'll get into that. While religions have similar attributes, they disagree on virtually everything. I'm gonna read you a quick thing, and we may run over a little bit today, or at least in this part. This was written by a British journalist, uh, and it's, it's very uh, sarcastic, it's very satirical. Uh, but think about what he says. It's called the Modern Thinker's Creed. And this especially hits this part about where every road is supposed to lead to Rome. So he goes in and he says, we believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe that everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone, to the best of your definition of hurt, and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex during, before, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything's getting better 
despite evidence to the contrary. The evidence must be investigated, and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man, just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, though we think his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the one that we read was. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. We believe that death comes after death comes the nothing, because when we ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end, if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, excepting perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson, what's selected is average, what average is normal is what normal is good. We believe in totally disarm, total disarmament. We believe there are direct lines between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors and the Russians would be sure to follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. That is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth, excepting the truth that there is no absolute truth. Again, he's playing on the roadrunner. We believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on rampage, whites go looting, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. Pretty profound. But he really ties in in a satirical and a very sarcastic and dark note. What we're talking about here, what is professed in our culture as truth is pure insanity. And he shows the circular thinking within that. And he shows the problem with that. So I can give that a copy to anybody that wants that. Um, but we'll talk about the differences between Christianity and atheism when it comes to the truth. Okay. Religious pluralism. This is the belief. And we talked a little bit about it last week. It's this belief that all religions are true which if you just think about it is total nonsense. It really is. Uh, and we try to, a lot of the times you need to put it into analogies, okay? But the problem is, is the consequence is that we're all gonna die. And just like gravity, whatever is true to reality will be true for you, okay? Because truth is exclusive. It's absolute, it's universal. Hopefully we don't discover it on the wrong side of truth. That's why the message is so important. So truth is absolute, truth is exclusive and knowable. To deny absolute truth and its knowability is self-defeating. It's necessarily false when you say no, there is no truth. Showing that it's self-defeating shows that there is truth. It's undeniable. And every time you try to deny it, you affirm it, okay? I know these are things that maybe, you know, are, are more troubling or are more kind of mull around. But basically, any statement that is unaffirmable because it contradicts itself must be false. This is how we can take down entire worldviews by showing that their premises are contradictory. They're incoherent. It cannot be true. Okay? Uh, relativists are defeated by their own logic. Okay? They kind of cut the branch that they're sitting on. So in summary as well, truth is not dependent on our feelings or preferences. Something is true whether we like it or not. Contrary to popular opinion, I don't know if it's still on TV, but believer Reza Aslan has written many books on Christianity. He's Muslim. He, he teaches, I believe, at Harvard. Not 100% sure on that. Um, but contrary to popular opinion, major world religions do not all teach the same things. All you have to do is dig a little into any religion and you'll see they have contradictory. Logically, all religions cannot be true. We are to respect the beliefs of others, but if what we believe is true, we need to lovingly tell them the truth. Because just like gravity, if somebody jumps off a cliff, there are consequences. Religion is the same way, and we'll get more of that into chapter two. So questions, I know that was a little more uh, than about, but we still have about 15 minutes. Any other questions on that part that we talked about 
in I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Any questions on that? Any questions in your reading that something that didn't seem clear uh, or need a little more explanation or you felt was, was false? I just had a, a lot of underlining and marking. Yes. And good. I, you probably did that beforehand anyways. Did you usually? Okay, because I annotate in all my books. It's hard for a lot of people, though. A lot of people are like, I don't want to write my, and I, my Bible, actually, the binding fell apart. I had stuck so much in it, written in so much. Uh, okay. All right. Why don't we move on to tactics then? We'll just look. I don't have any PowerPoints for tactics. We'll just discuss it. Uh, everybody knows what an ambassador is, correct? That was pretty, I didn't see a lot of words in there that I didn't think you guys would have difficulty. Uh, rhetoric, how about rhetoric? Are you guys familiar with the term rhetoric? Okay, rhetoric is the art of argument in a lot of ways, or the art of persuasion. And usually it contained, well, it's, it's part of the art of persuasion. And when we think of rhetoricians, we think of people who are usually good speakers uh, that can persuade people, not necessarily with facts, but just with the way emotional appeal. Now, not all people who practice rhetoric are doing that, uh, but sometimes it can be used that way. So it's the, the art of, of discussing and, and debating, okay? Uh, and tactics, everybody know what tactics are, okay? They're kind of like little points that you enact to get a point or to, to get a result, okay? And a strategy, he used strategy in the verse, or not in the verse, but in the chapter. Did you guys understand the difference between strategy and tactics? He said that's like the big picture. Yep, strategy is the big picture. Tactics are your individual plans within it uh, to, to go. The strategy looks at the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, okay? Let me ask you this, you guys, what is the reputation of apologetics? If you talk to anybody about apologetics, usually do you have any response or have you talked to anybody about it by chance? What, what have you seen? I usually have always thought even that it's really above my head. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's just way too deep for me. One thing you'll really like then is because especially with tactics, a lot of things you're gonna be able to do, and this is really the Roadrunner tactic is one of the main ploys we use in the surveys that we're gonna talk about after break. It's showing the inconsistency and the necessary, now you may not use those terms, but the necessary falsity of what they hold to be true. Something has to give. And so we're trying to get them into a point of uh, kind of like a stone, you know, Greg Kokel talks a lot about the stone in the shoe. You know, it's just so annoying. But we're trying to get them to where they're uncomfortable with their beliefs because they're false. Uh, and we're helping them to see that. But in that process, apologetics, you can ask a lot of questions and you don't have to feel like you're on the spot. And it's definitely not above your pay grade uh, in that sense. Um, it's one of those things that, uh, it's, it's a little bit here, a little bit there, precept upon precept, you know, uh, and, it, and it comes, wrote. Uh, and a lot of it, there's some really good books out there, so don't worry about it. But how do you think other people view apologetics? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, that, that I get a lot of time, and then you say, oh, it's, it's uh, you know, you're apologizing all the time. I think it actually has a very negative. A lot of people see it as a combative uh, way of looking at it. I don't think it is. I think it can be practiced that way. But all apologetics is defending, but we need to know how to do it as he says, and that's one of the things I really like about his approach is he calls it the ambassador model, where you need certain things to well represent the kingdom. Uh, now, are we going to be attacking thoughts and ideas and understandings? Yes. So how do we offset that? We offset that by using proper 
tactics by how we express it. You know, sometimes we need to make sure that our arguments may be uh, causing people uh, to be offended because they don't like what they hear. But it should not be us personally that are offending them with our actions. Does that make sense to everybody? And I think sometimes apologetics can get a bad rap. But again, that's the person conflict sometimes that arises. And it is definitely not. Okay. You know, this is one that uh, you may like to never make an assault, a frontal assault on a superior force. That was one of his comments. What do you think that means? Do you remember that part? Well, to where if you can see it's going to end up badly, don't even start out yet. Maybe not necessarily start out, but think what's a situation that some of our kids and students may face where they're facing a frontal assault of a superior force? Professors. Professors, that's exactly right. So in that situation, you still, you are the student. So the first thing you have to do is think about your strategy and tactic. The best thing to do is use questions. And so when you, you find out how you can engage that superior force. So say you have a situation where maybe the student is hearing some circular reasoning. You know, Prof, you told me that the rocks are dated by the fossils, but the fossils are dated by the rock layers they're in. I seem to be going in a circle. Can you explain that? Maybe the guy will say, oh, you're probably some Christian. What do you believe? Your response is, I'm a student. I'm just trying to learn. I'm asking you a question because it's inconsistent. So I haven't claimed anything. So you have not made a frontal assault. You have used the tools of asking questions. We'll get into the Columbo tactic uh, more thoroughly starting next week. But you've asserted nothing. You're in your proper position. So those are kind of the tactics that you can learn. Because if you go up and you, even if you have the facts, if you just say, you're wrong, prof, this is, can he shut you up whenever he wants? Yeah, you have no option. So don't use, so think through the tactics. And that's what the tactic book will help you with in those certain situations. Okay? What are, did you have any thoughts or particular questions on tactics? I, I really liked what you'd already mentioned about putting a stone in someone's shoe. Oh, yeah. And just this week, you know, realizing that I was going to need to talk to some people and, you know, with, with the questionnaire and really start thinking who and one thing or another how, how to do that and with certain people that I have in mind to do it with mm -hmm. how they approach and things and you think yeah if you tell them that you're not there to necessarily get into a big hairy discussion but just just you know want your opinion on these questions or whatever but just put that stone there where yeah. they begin to think well and the great thing about it as we learn different logical tactics you don't even have to bring Christianity into the, into the conversation. You can just say, wait, you're claiming this, but it contradicts something else you believe. They can't both be right. And so you can work through it in that sense without even bringing up Christianity. The one thing that I do think that he states well is that you don't have to bring it. We as Christians a lot of times feel we have to take them the full gamut. And we feel pressure on ourselves when we don't. I've got to get him to, uh, you know, uh, faith in Christ. Uh, well, when we look at Paul, and especially when he's talking to the Corinthians church, Apollos watered, you know, so-and-so planted, but God brings forth the growth. That if we take the pressure off of us and say, we're just learning how to talk to them and help them to see problems in their thinking. Because every time you take a problem in thinking a fallacy away, it will make the road to Christ clearer. Okay? Now, many people would say, well, it's a big fallacy to believe in Christ. You know. But with right thinking, we will always lead uh, to Christ. So I think that we need to remember. Now, the only time that I would object that we can leave them 
is I feel uncomfortable leaving someone with a heavy dose of the law and having someone in a position of despair without at least saying something to the effect that, that that's not the way reality is. There is a place where there's hope. Um, because I can just imagine if you've given somebody the law and they end up committing suicide because the law crushes. Okay? But most of the conversations will probably not be that way. There'll be just little nuggets and you tear. You guys, it usually takes several years on individual conversations for people to come, depending on where they are, to come to Christ. A lot of time. Um, if anyone gets mad, who loses? Yeah, the person who gets mad. Because everybody loves an underdog. We really, as ambassadors to Christ, need to be able to hold. Um, okay. Uh, do people, you think, think through the logical consequences of their convictions? No. I don't think so either. In the book, he is talking with a Wiccan. And he starts asking her questions. And so some of those questions are around life. And Wiccans, they respect all life. And so he, he said, though, obviously you must be pro-life. Oh, no, no. He knew enough to bring her into a contradiction to the, where, to the point where she was all flustered because the little sound bites didn't fit what she professed. She saw the inconsistency. He didn't say a single thing about what he believed. He made her dig through her thoughts and give appropriate answers. He was just asking questions, okay? But I think that's with most people. I think most people, Nathan said this the first time I took him to Berkeley. He was so nervous the first day he went out to do interviews. He was 13 years old. He came back and he said, Dad, within three questions, you've extended their deep thinking. Mm -hmm. He said, people are very shallow thinkers. We don't want to be, and we want to help people see that they aren't digging deep enough, okay? Um, I think you guys saw the power of the tactical approach. Again, you're off the hot seat. Uh, so this book is a great accompaniment. Um, he talks about the three skills of an ambassador, knowledge, wisdom, and character. You do need to know things about the faith. So we should also always be deepening our biblical knowledge but we should also be digging into the things that are attacking our faith in this time and at this place. Luther used to say that if you see any place where the devil is attacking the church and you are not defending, you are denying the faith. So we can see where the culture is attacking. Those are areas that we need to maybe beef up. One of them especially is creation evolution, okay? Another one would be the historicity of the New Testament. So those are areas that may be good to start a little deeper reading, okay? And you guys, I, I got this great text from Stan. Stan doesn't know I'm using it. So, but uh, Stan sent me this today. Uh, he's actually my daughter-in-law's uh, father, and they're probably really sad that we met because we have good times. So he says, I heard someone say it like this. Most people never do anything because they are scared to be bad at something publicly. But to start anything requires you to begin. By definition, that makes you a beginner. Beginners are not going to be very good. But you can only be a beginner at the beginning. So plan to move through the stage quickly with practice. And I think that's very appropriately. Voltaire said, the enemy of the good is the perfect. If we think that we always have to be perfect, just be honest, be authentic. You guys, I truly believe that as you engage in conversations, you will find that we have the truth on our side. You may not have it in your head right away, but if you're talking to someone, say, hey, that's a great question. Let me do some research and I'll get back to you and just keep it open. People love authenticity in that way. Okay, so just be open about it. But, so knowledge, we do have to grow in knowledge. Wisdom is how you use that knowledge. Okay, and then character, who you are. It really falls into uh, Aristotle when he discovered <laughs> the art of persuasion, 
or at least how humans are persuaded. And he said there were three areas, okay? And they were the pathos, the ethos, and the logos. First, you had to have what it was to be believed. You had to have the objective facts or what, was you, what you were presenting. The ethos was basically uh, the, and I'm gonna actually, because my mind, um, is the emotional engagement. A lot of the times we get this through storytelling, or that's, and then how reliable were you? If you're seen as an untrustworthy, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, if your moral character is not good, don't expect people to be persuaded a lot of the times. And it's interesting because in the early church, when we see uh, Justin Martyr, when he's writing to Antonius Pius, it is look at the lives we live. You know, and we still can say that in some places, but not as much. And I don't think that's necessarily a fault of the church, but I think it's false. Uh, it's because wolves have come among the church. So, so uh, tactics can be abused. They're not slick tricks, okay? They're not for going after somebody. They're for helping people to understand, even us, what is true. We are going to take a break, okay? Um, so uh, I think we covered any other questions on tactics. We haven't gotten into any specific tactics. It's more just background. But while, while you guys are sitting there, I was going to read another quote. Uh, one of my favorite authors is G.K. Chesterton. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Uh, he was a Catholic writer, laity, uh, but he was a journalist. Just really the way that he would expose. Uh, he was witty. He was just really a good wordsmith. He, he actually, if you're into mysteries, he wrote an entire set of mysteries called the Father Brown Mysteries. They yeah. Them, yes, and they're, they're not necessarily, except the newer one, actually, I like how they portray the Pete priest. I think they actually did a good job in other ones. But he wrote a lot of other books that are not uh, fictional. Uh, but this is one of his quotes, and it goes into kind of the, what we were talking about with truth, subjectivity, and uh, skepticism. And this comes out of his uh, Orthodoxy, the book called Orthodoxy. It says, but the new rebel is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never be really a revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything really gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. As a politician, he will cry out that war is a waste of life. And then as a philosopher, that all life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant and then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his books on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he has lost his right to rebel against anything. And I think it shows the conundrum that really, but, but the sad thing is we're not calling enough people out on it. Now, there are voices out there, uh, and, and in our environment it's different, but I think it's, it starts with those putting rocks in their shoes, helping to see people when their thoughts are really just bad thoughts. Not necessarily morally evil, which those are bad as well, but they're just silly because they make no sense. Uh, and we don't, we're not mean about it. We're not, uh, you know, we don't disregard the image of God in anyone, but we help people to see that what they believe really is insane because it contradicts itself or it causes multiple problems. Uh, again, we want people to see reality.
All right, so we have, so basically we have the survey and I think Brian is maybe going to get in some of his surveys that he did today so that we can talk about. So since you started, we'll start with you. So you said, go ahead, we don't, obviously no names. Um, so just kind of, uh, kind of a vague, you had said that this individual was, uh, uh, was raised Jewish? Yes. Okay. Very dysfunctional home. Okay. Very dysfunctional. And then Jewish and um, was, I'll just say that because she wouldn't mind me saying it all. Just very, yeah. very defensive, very argumentative whenever we were together. Okay. As a family. Um, until I think um, probably about nine, ten years ago or so, she became Christian. Okay. And I'm not sure who walked into her life or what changed, but um, anyway, she's uh, Christian. So she's a professing uh, Christian, which is fantastic. Is. And one thing I always want to say, because these surveys, a lot of times they show inconsistencies. And I always let people know, especially if it's a friend that I'm doing these conversations with or with students, it doesn't mean you're not a believer if you have inconsistencies yeah. because faith in Christ is very simple. Um, we're all growing in our knowledge of what a biblical worldview is. Yeah. And so, yeah. So did you find inconsistencies? No. Oh, no, wow. At all. So what are, what are some of the answers? Well, uh, I, she said, I asked, do you believe in God? And this was over the phone. Even. Okay. And she said, yes. And she described him as loving, but just. And her answers were just, you know, really clear, quick answers, really. And, you know, for me, it'd take me a while to think probably longer right. than it took her. But, um, you know, she, uh, let's see. What happens when you die? She says, you are, if you are a believer in Christ, you're in heaven. But those who have not come to faith, she feels they have one more chance, that God gives them the chance like the thief on the cross. So After says, they die? No, before they die. But like, Did you ask her what her biblical basis for that was? I didn't. I didn't. So that's where I love to drill down. Okay. Now, so, did we go through the four questions in here? What did you mean by that? Just briefly. How did you come end. to that conclusion? Yeah, just okay. Briefly at the end, and I thought about that after we talked. So we'll be yeah. talking again. So cool. I will ask her then too. But um, also, one question that I like to ask: What do they mean by heaven? Let's see. Was that interesting? It's not. No, but when you said, you know, those who die in Christ go to heaven, yeah. the idea of heaven is so broad. Is. Um, most people, unfortunately, and I've talked to, and I won't name names, but a, a gentleman before he, his wife had passed and he was getting close. And so one of the questions he asked me is he said, well, I even know my wife. Will I recognize her? And in discussion, I found out that he had none of the hope that Christians should have in understanding. But he also lost the physicality. Most people lose the physicality. It will be a new heaven and a new earth. We will inhabit a planet. It will be what it was like prior. And so a lot of people have a very different view. So it's just a side note. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good yeah. to dig into what their idea of heaven is because it's broad. That's it. Yeah. Yep. So did she believed in creation? She did. Okay. Definitely. And um, do you think believe in such a thing as objective morality? And she definitely said yes. Okay. Okay. And I thought the most serious problem in the world facing the world today, she said it boils down to religion itself. Okay. I yeah. thought that was we are idol factories. Yeah. Um, and we will constantly, if God is not on the throne, something else, and usually ourselves, yeah. in some yes, way, yeah. or fame, or money, or, yeah. or whatever. Um, so. Then uh, she said, I ask her, um, if you could ask one question about the Christian faith, what would it be? And she says, I don't have one. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as far as the Christian faith, 
you'd have a question. You're, she says, I have questions I'm going to ask. I'd like to ask God, but once I get there, they won't make any difference anyway. <laughs> but as mm -hmm. far as question of the Christian faith, she didn't have any. See, the only thing I would say on that is there's a great book, and it was actually written for millennials, and it's actually the daughter of the Hobby Lobby, the Green family. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, and it's called Not What You Think. And one of the things she put at the end is she's really trying to get people to reevaluate the Bible. And one of the things she says for those that are Bible believers to poke and prod the Bible, not to doubt it, but to ask questions. Uh, because I think sometimes we don't ask enough questions. Uh, and that's why I think a lot of heresy is coming to the church. I actually am more of afraid of my kid reading a Christian book that uh, has a non-Christian view than an atheist book that has a non-Christian view. Um, so a lot of the times, if, if uh, I was talking to that individual, I think I would take it a step farther and say, well, there's nothing that bothers you about the Christian faith. There's nothing that you struggle with uh, because the hiddenness of God or, you know, uh, in, you know, just go to a child oncology unit. You know, those kind of things. And maybe, maybe she's dealt with those. Maybe she's thought about those and she's reconciled that intellectually, you know, they're good answers. Emotionally, it may not feel so good, but God is in control. But I think as Christians, we need to read deeper. Not, not trying to find things that aren't there, but trying to truly wrestle. Now, I think the best way to wrestle is to interact with atheists <laughs> or, or those that don't believe because they will challenge you. Uh, and then it'll cause you to think deeply about that. Well, that's great. Cool. Yes. Uh, for his, my brother, said something and he had AOS so he was dying and, and we had a pretty good connection but then when it came to talking about God uh -huh. you know basically he went to confirmation and uh, never went to church after that probably okay. just left and stuff like that and then he said well kind of like why are you talking to me now uh, I haven't changed I'm just same as I've always been, and kind of had a good point. It kind of stumped me in a way, you know, or like, uh, why are you talking to me now? And actually, the Lutheran pastor there. Mm -hmm. So this was not you talking to him. It was a Lutheran pastor talking well, well, to him. Well, no, that was me. Oh, that was you. Okay. said that to me, and then uh, kind of stumped me a little bit. And then the Lutheran pastor there in the same town, didn't seem to make a connection. I think Don was kind of argumentative and, and stuff like that, or well, why are you beating up on me this way, or uh, stuff like that. But Don, the chaplain there made a connection with him. That's Don good. felt that he was good enough. You know, I'm thinking, you know, and that's our, was our concern, is that he was dying and he was not in the right place too, probably. Right. So opening conversation with him then was was kind of difficult. But um, I think better late still than never. Issue, I think. Better late than never. And I, I think it does bring port forward the point that and and he probably, you know, and maybe he was like I don't know if he thought, well, why didn't you care about this earlier? Why didn't you bring this up earlier? Why um, that I think it's those times that we need to always be open for opportunities. I think th it, it is though. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I know people that it's just really, it's ironic. C.S. Lewis used to think, and I'm paraphrasing, this comes from a, a recent biography by Alistair McGrath. But in it, C.S. Lewis said that he felt he was a horrible apologist because those nearest to him were not believers. And I think that's just the way for lack of a better term, the cookie crumbles. Uh, those closest, I think there's a lot more emotional pushback and volitional pushback. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of things where if you're talking to people who don't know you or not living with you on a, you know, maybe arguments are more persuasive. Uh, but it is hard. Family is, is really hard. You didn't realize how unskilled I was or, mm -hmm. or just made me look back at myself. Yep. Uh, just how to handle a situation like that. Those are hard moments, aren't they? I heard a the guy I talked to had a, uh -huh. uh, a statement that I thought this is interesting. I, he said, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When it comes to fear, yes. Yeah, so. So who did you interview then? Well, it's a place next door, and they're okay. Anywhere's from homeless. There, most everybody there has a problem, but this guy has a came from no generation. He's pretty well rounded, and okay. uh, he does Surprise have. Us. So is he? He's a worker there, or is he one of the tenants there? He lives there. Okay, lives so there. Yeah. okay, he's cool. Old. Yeah, he's old. And, uh, I actually found out he's American Lutheran, and he seemed to be informed enough that that uh, he said, you know, I don't agree with things that's going on in that church now. Okay, so he was, you know. He hasn't been to church for a long time. I, um, I kind of offered him about going to our church, and he didn't know at that time. But uh, just, uh, let's see, a meeting of life, well, he said you can worry yourself to death. You know, he had answers that seem like he's pretty well grounded. Uh, uh, what is that? Started with the pen. What is a human being? Well, God says so. You know, so. He, so he was basically saying whatever God says is what a human is, or. or let's see. What is a human being? Uh, it, Uh, as compared to, are we different from animals or something like that? Uh huh. Um, so he said, if God says so, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, truth that he associated that with number nine. Truth. Do you believe that truth exists? Then mm -hmm. he he says, well, talked about family, and he got that from his family. And I think there are. So he was almost saying truth is culturally conditioned? <clears throat> this wasn't a deep discussion. <laughs> hey, no, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people do believe that. We hear that argument from atheists a lot of the times. If you would have been born in India, you would have been a Hindu. If you were born, you know, here, you would have been this. And it's like, well, that may be true, but that doesn't tell us whether or not it's true. Yep. Yeah. And that's why I would really recommend like those four questions. Uh, and we'll get similar questions through tactics. Uh, but the ones that we've used for, for quite a while, what do you mean by that? It's a clarifying question. It really opens the door, especially when someone says they believe in God. You're like, okay, what do you mean by God? Oh my goodness. It's all over the board. It's such a, God really to me is a useless term. Uh, unless you say you're using it generally like, yeah, this is a theistic universe, because the, the ideas that go into God vary with every person. That I really think when someone says they believe in God, you, you really have to clarify. Especially someone you don't know. You may know them, and you're like, oh, I know what they mean by God. Um, the second one, so the first one is clarifying. It's opening it up, making them define their terms, and helping you to understand exactly what they mean. The next one that is, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? That now is asking for why did you come to the conclusion that you have? What is the evidence that you have? What are the things that you looked at? Did you research it? You know, a, a lot of the times, and it's not meant to be a snarky question, but when people say something and they're very adamant, you're like, well, how'd you come to that conclusion? Did you read on it? Did you, most of the time it's, well, no, I, uh, <laughs> You know, and again, you're not there to embarrass them, but you help them realize that maybe they don't know as much as they think they know about that subject. A lot of times they might respond, well, I feel like that's true. Yeah. Or it yeah. seems right to yeah. me. 
Yeah. So, all right. It almost even kind of reminds me of uh, they did what's right in their own eyes, as the Bible talks about in Judges. Yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the dialogues? Did you have a chance to do any interviews? I didn't get the paper. I was late last night. Oh, I'm but sorry. Paper, I oh, gosh. Yeah, I'll get you some so that you know. Yeah. And then you can use it as kind of what's up on the, the board. But yeah, I'll get you some because I have some extras. So what, do you, what were some of the interviews you had on campus today? Uh, so today... Uh, so I wanted to talk to more people. I shortened the interview to only five questions um, so I could get people a handout for tomorrow's event um, at the college. There's uh, Frank Turek, of one, of the authors. one of the authors of I Don't Have Enough Faith, is actually going to be here at CMU at campus tomorrow night. So I wanted to get that card into their hand and, and get them thinking about could there possibly be evidence for God? Because I know that's that's his thing, is that book is, you know, here are evidences for God. So well, there's four uh, questions that he's particularly talking about, right? Or four topics that were on that card. Yeah, they're on that yeah. card. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't really go specifically into those questions, God. but mm -hmm. um, you know, so I started with, well, do you believe in a God or a higher power? Why or why not? Um, then I thought the second one was was good to use to get people thinking um so yes or no on the first one uh, and, and you know why or why not on the first one but then does it matter if there's a god or a higher power and i think you'd be surprised at how many people say it doesn't matter well it doesn't matter to me you know if there's a god or a higher power uh and to me that's kind of like, um, well, no, wait a second. It doesn't matter if there's a creator God who did all this. And it doesn't matter what the meaning and purpose of life is. Like, did you try I, to break would, that down? So I would usually follow up with the question, uh, well, what happens when we die? Uh, because that's an obvious one that, yeah, if there's something after death. Right. Um, it might some matter if, to this, so if what? it's heaven or hell, it matters. If it's reincarnation, you don't want to be reincarnated as a slog or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, so it matters, you know, if there is a God or a higher power. Uh, then I asked, what does it mean to have faith in a God or a higher power? What does it mean to have faith or what, what is faith? Um, kind of looking at what because I think there's a lot of people that have this understanding that faith is just a blind faith faith is just kind of something you believe in without evidence or as even even in the face of evidence or in opposed to the evidence you still are going to believe what you believe um, and I don't think that's the right way to view faith it's not a biblical faith and we talked uh, I think we, you remember us talking about, I talked about a gentleman by the name of Peter Bogosian, uh, who was at the university in Portland. He resigned because of, uh, this is where we can be co-belligerents, that the cancel culture and everything that has happened is not allowed truth. Uh, you know, you can't say certain things. It's, it's basically ideological bashing. Um, so he recently left, his resignation letter is interesting online, but he wrote in a book called Manual for Creating Atheists that he said, you tell them what faith means. That faith is believing in things that are shown to be false, or faith is believing in things, you know, you think of Mark Twain, things that just ain't so. And the sad thing is, is when you watch these people go out and use his tactics on the street, most Christians agree with that definition of faith, which Brian was just talking about is an incorrect. Uh, but that's what people think it is. Yeah. Uh, and I will tell people, like, I don't think I would be a Christian if I didn't believe there's evidence for Christianity. Um, and so that evidence actually does uh, build faith, support uh, a trust in God, you know, in the Creator. Uh, so my fourth question there, is it possible for there to be scientific or logical evidence for God? Why or why not? So is it possible for there to be evidence? Chapter 2 and 3 and 
that we're coming up to in our book will answer those. Yep. And uh, because I wanted to see, are they really willing? Are they really interested or, or um, allowing, you know, a lot of people will call themselves open-minded, but usually it's open-minded with a closed door to the Christian faith, it seems. Yeah, I like the, I like the quip that says evidence will not convince those unwilling you know, the unwilling, you know, it doesn't matter what evidence. And I, I do think, and we could debate the casting pearl before swine uh, kind of idea that we get in the Gospels, but I think we do need to be aware. And I know of some apologists that will even ask, if there is evidence, would you even be willing to change your mind? And I know Dave and Mary Jo have had experiences. So one of the guys who was more on the atheistic side today, um, and I think he, maybe, <laughs> I think was kind of a, his answer to that one, I think. I remember, I might not have phrased it that way. And then the last question I had is, if you could ask one question about the Christian faith, what would it be? So it's kind of opening the door. The, these questions kind of open the door for, you know, is it possible for there to be evidence? What evidence would you accept? <clears throat> what, what questions do you have? Because Frank Turek is just so good. You look up his YouTube videos even, and I mentioned this to most all the students I talked to. I said, here's a card, come tomorrow night. You know, uh, even if you can't, you know, I love his YouTube videos. He does a good job answering these questions um, by and large for the most part. Now more is, a, you know, because we are gonna put this online and so not everybody will be in the class, you know, just, there are things, uh, and I think everybody knows that within Christianity that we can have disagreements on that doesn't necessarily hurt, uh, obviously, our standing before Christ. Uh, obviously, we have some disagreements in the creation issue, uh, but I will say that Frank Turek has been one of the most graceful uh, and gracious people who, I would say, from my understanding, disagree with us on on some creation issues but he has never been belligerent about it and we agree on so much more um but just as uh just so people know fully that you know there are disagreements but those are what christians should be able to discuss and hopefully come to a knowledge so so what were some of the responses um yeah, does it matter if there's a God or a higher power? Um, one guy says, well, it doesn't matter to me, you know. Uh, I think a lot of people, it's kind of like, well, it's, it's an individual thing. It's a personal thing where, it, you know, if you're devoted to it, it's important to you. If not, you know, you can believe whatever you want. There's kind of a lot of times this idea that all, all religions really end up in the same place, you know, and so you don't have to... Uh, force things on people. Uh, I get a lot of times from people that will call themselves Christians uh, that, well, I won't force my beliefs on anybody else or, or you know, it's okay for other people to believe what they want to believe. And I have to kind of reason with them and say, well, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So, is it okay that, I mean, shouldn't we be telling people that, it, or, or maybe I, I, a good question to ask is, it, is that really true? Is he really the only way to heaven? And I did have one guy, this was like last year or two, mm -hmm. he, he was making the argument that Jesus never said he was the only way to be saved or the only way to heaven. And I said, well, I don't know, that verse makes it pretty clear. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, well, he didn't say the only way, the only truth. And so there's still that desire to wiggle around the truth. Uh, but yeah, it's. I think it's a hopefully an eye-opener to those who call themselves Christians too that do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe God's word as it says it is? Or are we believing other things that aren't true? Well, yeah.
So did you find any, as we're talking about the Roadrunner tactic, did you find any where you could see, uh, you know, inherent problems? Uh, between maybe what they professed and, and I know you were going towards a particular end uh, with some of those questions. A lot of times, I mean, when doing the general surveys, mm -hmm. the biggest one for that is, uh, do you believe there's an objective absolute morality, meaning, as, meaning that there are things that are right or wrong no matter what, no matter right. who you are. Uh, and a lot of times people say, no, it's just kind of, there's a lot of gray areas and, you know, what's, uh, you know, it's a lot of just different beliefs uh, for different people. Uh, but then when you get to the question of what are the biggest problems the world is facing today and how can they be fixed? People are very quick <laughs> to answer like, oh yeah, there's all these problems and they'll yeah. list off certain things. A lot of times politicians or politics uh, or racism or whatever comes inequality up. Inequality issues. Uh, inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like they know right and wrong, but they don't often think through right. the fact that, oh, yeah. I have no way to ground this. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's my opinion. Yeah. Is this just opinion or is this absolutely true no matter what? And, I, I truly do think the moral argument is one of the strongest arguments because I think it's one that we all feel and we know. There are things that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes with certain arguments because certain arguments, and, and it takes a lot of explaining when it comes to a lot of the creation arguments, but sometimes they'll get out or say, well, you know, they'll rely on scientists. They'll say, well, the scientists believe this or whatever, and sometimes they won't even listen. But I think that internal tug to know that killing young children for fun is always wrong in everywhere, in every place, because the image of God, that character is stamped on us unless we have obviously seared our consciences, uh, you know, as scripture talks about. Um, but you'll find, and, and the thing great with this survey is you use it, uh, you'll find that as you dig deeper, I think almost everybody you talk to, you will uncover contradictions if you dig deep. Because we haven't thought through all these issues. Most people have not through, thought consistently through these or have evaluated them. And so it is great both for us, because sometimes we can see a contradiction in something somebody says, but what we find out is, oh, I have the same contradiction, because I would have answered the question the same way. So it's a great evaluative tool as well. Now, hopefully you get to the point where these questions are kind of in your brain. So you're not, sometimes, you know, friends, if you're like, hey, excuse me, can I get my clipboard? Can I write down your answers so I can show where you have issues? <laughs> it's, sometimes it's not taken too kindly too. But I think as you use it and the rote repetition, the four questions, the tactics that we'll learn I think you, you, you can use those in, in multiple different ways um, to really uncover. Uh, I think it's a great tool. Uh, Brian and I, he'll go out and he'll do uh, surveys and we'll talk a good hour or two hours on things. Sometimes he'll come in and depending on the day and we'll talk and we're like, well, how could we have probed deeper? Oh yeah, we could have done that. Or, you know, this would have been a good follow-up question. And so it's constant practice. And I think that's where we lose some of it because really most worldviews will break down without you really, I mean, people see the inconsistencies. Uh, sometimes we have to point them out, but once you point them out, uh, another strong contradiction that we get is usually when it comes to meaning and what are humans, and morality and creation because creation by a theistic god is the only one that can ground any of those well 
All of us strive for meaning. All of us believe things are right or wrong, whether or not we, we profess it or not. Uh, you know, you love the great quip where uh, they were in a Bible study, and I think it goes back to Francis Schaeffer. But he basically, you know, somebody said, oh, there is no such thing as right or wrong. And, you know, so the guy went and boiled some water on a stove and was about ready to pour it over the guy that said there is no right or wrong. And, you know, he storms out because in actuality, no one believes that. We may profess it, but that's where we then dig in and help them to see they don't really believe it. Uh, showing them examples or helping them to see. But really there is no foundation for meaning, morality, identity, really that, that is worthwhile that comes from an evolutionary standpoint. Uh, I talked to two individuals and I think, I don't know if I've relayed this story to you guys, but one of the first times I was out on the Berkeley campus, I know I've told you, I was talking to two uh, Hispanic gals that were there doing minority lesbian studies at Berkeley. And so they believed in evolution. They believed, but their main goal in life was inequality to minorities and especially sexual minorities. And so I looked at them and we had talked about a lot of different things. And I said, well, I see in my worldview where inequality comes from. I said, where does it come from in your worldview? Why does what you pursue matter? Really, it's a matter of opinion. Your whole life's endeavor has nothing more than your own personal pursuit because you can't ground it. Um, and actually, we, we talked about it more in depth. And what they started to see was their main goal in life, according to what they believed in creation, made it just that, a personal opinion. Well, I don't care. You may think, now, and I told them that I don't believe this, I don't believe in the oppression and things, but I said, well, according to your worldview, it's my opinion, but you know what, if I'm stronger and bigger and, and it's not my opinion, how are you gonna prove to me it's wrong? There's nothing outside of ourselves that you can point to. And if there's nothing outside of ourselves, there's nothing transcendental about it, and it is purely a matter of opinion. I said, do you really believe that what you're fighting for is a matter of opinion? Of course not. They think it's absolutely true. But now they're thinking, wow, I got a problem, you know. And when I left, it was really nice because one of the gals said, you've given us a lot to think about. Left it at that. Now, I don't know if anything happened, but again, it was showing that that meaning and that purpose and the most fulfilling thing that they were doing or accomplishing without a theistic universe. Now, does that necessarily make it true? No, we need evidence. Now, it points to the truth, but then we have arguments for why we believe this is a theistic universe. Morality is one of them, but again, we have a cumulative approach that we will get throughout this book. So we've got just a couple of minutes. So uh, any final questions? I'm just going to grab the uh, syllabus for next week. I've got one question. Yes. Is it illogical for a naturalist to believe that anything should matter? Um, well, I, I think it's an unprovable assumption, almost like what they're saying with consciousness, that it emerges. They can't explain it, but they know it exists. So they just almost like magic say that it emerges. I don't think they can rationally explain it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting to the, uh, I'm thinking about when they, essentially defend their naturalistic view that there is nothing besides space, time, matter, and energy. Right. There's no spiritual. And, and mm -hmm. you know, if that's the case, can they logically argue that anything matters? No, and they really can't even use logic because logic is abstract. It's immaterial. So uh, these ideas like the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, and all these are abstract concepts, so they're immaterial. Um, 
but what they try to do is they do a, they, they do a uh, leap of faith and they say, well, it had to emerge uh, because it's here. Well, that's not an explanation. You know, uh, that's a cop-out. And a lot of people say, we do that with God, but it's not. There, there's a ground for the rationality and a beginning source uh, that actually causes the effects we see or could be reasonable for the causes we see or the effects that we see. But they, yeah, they have nothing. Uh, you know, now, that being said, there are people who believe in immaterial things that are atheists, but they'll come forward and say, we don't have an explanation. Uh, we just won't resort to God. Uh, but, and we'll get into this later, because uh, people like, uh, uh, oh, he wrote Straw Dogs, uh, Gray. Um, why am I forgetting? Uh, John Gray. Um, and he's an atheist. Uh, and he used to teach at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's a philosopher. And he basically said, you know, when you talk about truth, if the materialistic worldview is accurate, there's no such thing as truth. There just is. The concept is not there because it, survival is all that matters. And that's hard for people to wrap their minds around because we know truth. We, we, we know that it exists. We deal with it all the time. So I think it naturally shows the inadequacies of an evolutionary worldview because it also denies the rationality of a mind. So an atheist is going to use arguments and rationality to make his point to convince you. But yet he doesn't believe you can be convinced because there is no free will. And he's using arguments that comes from a rationality which cannot be explained in a materialistic universe. Now, those are things to kind of ponder and to think about that make your mind go numb at times. But their, their, their worldview breaks down on multiple levels. Um, and that's why the questions of how do you know that? How do you know that are such important questions? Yeah, no, I totally. Jason Lyle. Oh, you got another one? Go ahead. I was just gonna add to that real quick, but Jason Lyle, an apologist, Christian apologist says that um, them trying to use logic to prove their atheistic naturalistic point of view is like using air to prove that there is no air. They're trying to prove there is no air. They have to use air to prove, yeah. to make their arguments, make their voice <laughs> well, work to prove that there is no air. And Jason Lyle is one, uh, there's a school of thought called uh, presuppositional apologetics. Um, and Frank Turek even wrote a book similar to that, not because his is also evidential, but it's called Stealing from God. How the atheist has to steal from the Christian worldview even to make their arguments because their own worldview doesn't have the foundational capacity to give those qualities that he's using to try to break down the Christian worldview. But it, it's called Stealing from God. Uh, it's another book that he wrote. Um, but again, we really here focus on the creation because I really do believe the creation is the penultimate issue when it comes to understanding worldviews, trajectories. That, I mean, God is the foundational question. But that God and in creation, in today's day and age, it really is creation and evolution. Uh, and showing that. So next week, week four, so that'll be the 28th. Um, oh, today's the equinox. Okay. Uh, so, um, but the next chapter is why believe anything, okay? Now, the next week, I'm also going to give a focus point apologetic called the 10 Philosophical Assumptions of Science. I'm going to show you that science, if science is the basis of all knowledge, then it should be the first rung on the ladder of inquiry, okay? Does that make sense? But what we're actually going to find out that science is first and foremost supported by philosophical assumptions that cannot be proved by science. So science actually rests on philosophy as its foundation. So if science is the only thing that gives us true knowledge and it's based on philosophy, we have a problem. If philosophy doesn't give us sure knowledge because the whole edifice falls.
Okay, so that's what we'll do. And then we'll, we can come up with a survey or articles in regards to that that we'll talk about the following week. Okay, so again, uh, so next week, uh, why believe anything is kind of the overall topic. So I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. You need to read chapter two, okay, uh, which continues with the truth question and can we know truth in religious things, okay. Um, then for uh, tactics, game plan, we'll go chapters two through three, okay, which is the prior week, and then keep going through the Bible. So by the time we meet next week, you should be through Genesis 21. Write down any questions. All right. Yes, Dave. If anybody's interested, I have a copy of the questionnaire that's on one sheet. But I got from oh. one of you two guys. I don't know. I think one. Brian's the one that did that one. Yeah. So it's it's really handy if you're doing street corner type interviews mm -hmm. because it puts all twelve questions on one side, and it also has a clarification question at the bottom. Uh, and so I'm oh, that sure is. Sure, we can get you copies of that if it's, if you like. It can be a challenge to try to fit it all into the box unless you write like me and write really <laughs> tiny. Um, yes. <laughs> but. Uh, but we do have that available. Actually, I think it's all on our website, discovercreation.org slash survey. Mm -hmm. You can download either version of it. Yep, I'll put these on the back table. Uh, so these are additional surveys. Please, we'll put a copy back there just for your own growth as we go through all the books that we're going through. This survey will never be non-applicable. <laughs> Uh, because it deals with those five major questions that all worldviews have to answer that we talked about last week. We basically have, oh, and Roadrunner tactic applies to principle number four of the five points, test the idol, does it contradict itself? So again, that is a huge idea when it comes to incoherence, proving something is false to reality. But keep doing interviews because it's practice. And what I do a lot of the times is say I, I did an interview, then I go back and say, oh, I could ask this. And I write it down. Oh, I could ask this. I could ask this. And as you do that, you will become more and more proficient at the time to say, oh, well, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? And phrasing it different ways. Okay, cool. So we will see you next week.